originally a product manager of about 18 years and uh, done both product management and uh, this is well. So uh, philosophy, uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but we're basically a small design consultancy. And so we do a lot around kind of product design prototyping research. Um, and what we're going to talk about today is really how to build trustworthy AI products. Um, and there's a bunch of questions that I want to go through while we're, we're uh, talking today. And so the first one is really just what is AI? So I'll give you a quick five minute intro to that. Um, what is trust in general? Um, how do we actually, uh, you know, what, is, what does trust have to do with machines? I'll tell you a short story about that from my personal experience. Um, and then how do machines build trust with humans? Uh, then finally, we'll talk about what's the right level of trust, because it's not just about gaining as much trust as we can get. And then finally, um, the, uh, you know, what techniques can we actually use to understand what's, what's the right level of trust, how to build trust, uh, what are the right ways to kind of foster that relationship. Um, so what is AI in five minutes? Um, I really like this description of data science, machine learning, and AI, because these are the main terms uh, that are being used right now. And this is by uh, David Robinson, who is the chief data scientist at um, DataCamp, which if you ever want to do online courses around machine learning, uh, data science, it's a really great place to do that. It's pretty cheap, too, for a monthly rate. Um, and I do not get paid by them, just to be clear. Um, but data science is really meant to be about uh, how do we actually understand, how do we produce insights about something uh, within the world? Machine learning is about how do we then uh, find predictions or predictive capabilities from that data. And then artificial intelligence really just comes down to uh, taking action or making a decision. Um, so this is, a, this is an easy way I think of it. Now generally when you're talking about building a product of some type, you're gonna use, if you are using AI in this particular case, you'll actually be combining all of these things together. So you'll very rarely see that there's just decision making capability without insight or prediction capability. So that's something that humans use be able to take action. Um, <clears throat> let me talk at the basics. I want to talk a little bit about what it is not. What is what, is, what AI, machine learning, and data science isn't. Okay. So first of all, it's not all chatbots. Um, everybody that works in AI now has to build the chatbot and then fail at it. Um, so it's not just chatbots. There's a lot of other ways that you use these these different technologies. It's not magic fairy dust where you can just sprinkle over a product and suddenly it's more intelligent. Um, it's not the singularity or the terminator that's going to kill us all. Um, it's not her. It's not this type of, you know, uh, like something you'll fall in love with. Uh, it's not right now. Um, and then finally, or not finally, but uh, this is something I think is so funny is that there seems to be this like weird blue and black color palette and like sparkly brains and uh, like white robots with human faces and things like that equals AI and machine learning online. And that's, this is not it either. This is probably a very bad analogy, actually, for what AI is. Um, and then, you know, we talk a lot about, in, in the world of AI, about this, uh, this concept of human in the loop. Um, and this is usually where there's one machine that is interacting with a human, and it's that loop of kind of making decisions alongside the machine. Um, I'm going to go into this a little bit later, but it's not as simple as just that human in the loop anymore. It's not just one machine and one human. So what is it? Right. Um, if we're going to talk about data science, this is data science, free graphs. Right. In this particular case, it's a data set about irises that's used a lot in the beginning um, to talk about uh, whatever people are learning about data science. This is a way around kind of unsupervised clustering of different iris types based on petal length and petal width. That's all data science is. It's about trying to make an understanding or an insight out of a big set of data. Uh, when we talk about machine learning, this is machine learning. Okay. And so all this is doing is this is pulling in some data about how to do basically um, tra training a model around uh, square footage in relationship to housing costs. Okay, and this is the part that's really important right here is this idea of so here's the data, here's the training of the model, here's the prediction, and there's the output. There, machine learning, ta-da. Um, so it can be way more complicated. This the models that can be used can be way more complex. They can take days and days to train. But this is essentially what machine learning. Um, and then, you know, there's a special type of machine learning which is called deep learning, and the only difference between uh, neural networks and today what we call deep learning is really just that there's a lot more stages within this neural network than there was before, okay? And when we talk about neural networks, um, how many people are actually familiar with what a neural network is? Uh, okay, well, let me talk about that for a second then. So basically, neural networks, um, it uses the analogy of the way brains work. It's just the analogy, it's not exactly the way that brains work. Um, when it comes to the individual neurons. And so what it has is it has a bunch of inputs that come in, and then 
uh, uses what's called weights and, and biases between all of these different linkages. Um, and there's a calculation, and there's an output. Okay? So that's all the neural network is. It's basically a way to do multiplication and addition across this set of nodes in this, in this graph. Um, and so deep learning, before, it was very hard to calculate very, very large scale neural networks. Um, but because of graphics cards, because of big data, we're finally starting to be able to train these types of networks that are not even, you know, this is considered to be very small. But we're talking about tens of layers that with millions of neurons um, can actually train up to do very impressive things. But that's, that's deep learning in a very, very small nutshell. Um, next is uh, what I'll call artificial intelligence, which is really just decision making. And what this is, is this is a visualization of how to win a tic-tac-toe no matter what, or to tie um, And so all that that is, is it's just, in this case, it's a, just a plan. Right? It's a plan that's been pre-calculated by a computer um, and then put into a, you know, a visualization of how to do that. But that's all AI is, is that it's always meant to be this thing that is um, what humans can maybe do right now that machines couldn't is usually what AI is going to consider to be. But in the end, it's really about like, how do you allow machines to help make decisions or make decisions in some way? That's all it is. Um, now what I think when we talk about <laughs> the idea of um, what, what is the right analogy for machine learning? Remember all those sparkly brains and like the white robots? Um, I actually think it's closer to this idea of an ecosystem niche. So in this case, this is the dung beetle, which um, because of its environment, because of the other types of insects and animals that are around, it's evolved to have a very unique thing, which is that it collects dung, and it actually is able to uh, read the stars to understand which direction it is. That's a, another thing altogether. Um, but it's a very specific niche. And this insect is meant to be in that niche within the environment. And I think as we start to talk about how machine learning, AI, work within products, it's no longer um, just this idea of like some all-knowing, omnipresent intelligence. That's not what, what it is. It's more about tiny machines that exist within an ecosystem of, say, an organization or uh, a social network or something like that. So I think that's a better analogy as kind of insects within an ecosystem. Um, and then the other thing I would say is that because we're starting to talk about networks of people, this is actually a uh, visualization of Star Wars um, and all the different characters and how they interact with each other. And I like this one because it actually includes uh, androids in this case. Um, so like R2-D2 and C3PO within this network, right? And so it's, when we talk about our actual organizations, we have, um, say like a business, we'll have a network of people that are interacting with each other. And a lot of the times there will be intermediaries that are software. So that could be email today, that could be documents. Um, but in the future, it could be very narrow intelligences that are helping provide, say, predictive capabilities, um, certain types of visualizations. And so we're really thinking about the overall like organizational network um, with intelligences overlaid on top of it. And I think that's probably the better way to think about this than just one human and one computer interacting. So that's kind of AI in a nutshell, and I went really fast. Um, you're gonna have to read a lot more to actually <laughs> dive into this more deeply, but when we talk about it from a product context, um, this is really like a lot of other technologies, right? Like product people shouldn't actually know all of the things about, say, how a web page is made. They should know some of the trade-offs, and they should be able to have that discussion with their engineers about trade-offs. Um, but that, I, I don't think diving much deeper um, is always helpful. And so, what I do think is important, though, is what does it mean to be more human-centered um, around AI? And so, you know, at our, at my work, we do an awful lot around design thinking. We do a lot of lean and agile, um, and those things kind of intersecting talks a lot about how do we build things for people. Um, and so, we bring this uh, definition set up again. When I think about this from a human-centered standpoint, um, it really is data science is about insights about people, right? Uh, machine learning is about predictions for people to use, not just for no reason. And then finally, artificial intelligence is really about uh, producing actions to help people. Um, and if there's no human purpose that's behind any of this, then it doesn't really matter. Um, and I want you know, that to be very clear. Um, so let's talk a little bit about trust. Um, oh, by the way, and I am going, I, I, I'll be posting all the slides online if you guys uh, can't keep up on this, sorry. I talk very fast. Um, but what is trust, right? Uh, so I've read a lot of different papers, not only in trust and automation, but also just trying to discuss what the social implications of trust are in general. And probably the most succinct way to think about trust is that it really helps facilitate cooperative behavior. So when we talk about um, within a culture, we have certain types of norms, um, and that allows us to meet uh, for maybe the first time and then transact in some way, maybe in a cooperative way, so that we can get something done. And that's really what trust is about, right? Is this, this, that type of thing. 
Um, and I've started to, I tried to gather at least what I think the main factors of trust are, or how to really define trust uh, just in general. So one of them is that it's kind of, it's kind of a contract. In some ways it's written, so we have a contract between two people or two organizations. You'll believe something about that, that, that kind of relationship that you wouldn't have otherwise. But there's also one that, so when we talk about cultural norms or the way that different cultures display and have trust within, uh, with each other, um, that's very important. Uh, it, it talks, trust is always about some expectation for the future, not for the past, right? Um, it uses the past as data points to look towards the future. But it's always about what I think someone will do in the future, or how they'll react to me, or how they'll help me. Um, and then, you know, performance, accountability, and transparency tend to be very important aspects of trust. So, uh, performance is like, do I actually am I doing something that's valuable? Am I doing something that I say I'm going to do? Accountability is that if something goes wrong, you know, how am I at fault for that in some way? How do I take care of the problems that come up out of that? And then transparency is that, do you understand why I'm thinking the way I do or why I'm taking action? And how do you build models about the way I do things? Um, and this builds slowly, but it can be lost very quickly. Right? So that's, that's kind of my overview of trust. And a good example of how trust works in today's world, um, especially in the US, is around kind of patient and doctor trust. Um, so there's a lot of baggage that comes with this, both good and bad. Right? So there's good stuff that uh, doctors within the United States, at least, and I'm sure it's different worldwide um, in some subtleties, but you know, doctors go to school for a long time. Um, they have a ethical oath that they all take. And so we believe certain things about the way doctors, when they're communicating with us, how they will deal with us, and how they will give us information. Um, but it's also interesting that there, this is very much like a human consulting something like a machine learning algorithm that may know or be able to recognize patterns that the human couldn't, right? Is that the doctor knows an awful lot about the way biology works, um, but they don't necessarily explain everything they understand to the patients that they have. What they do need to do, though, is they need to give them enough information to be able to make decisions, sometimes like without them. And so I think that's a good way to think about the way that trust works is that um, there's expectations going into some type of relationship, and then there's an ongoing thing, that if the doctor continues to push for decisions that you don't believe in, you will then start to lose trust with that particular doctor. But there's kind of an initial trust that happens there. Um, so what does trust have to do with software? Right? Um, this is actually from a company that I ran about five or six years ago uh, called Complete Seating, and it was a open table competitor. Um, and our focus was actually, how do we help uh, managers and hosts uh, basically operate their restaurant in a more effective way? And we used a lot of what we called back then analysis or you know, analytics, business intelligence, and some prediction, um, and then you know, basically uh, constraint programming, which you know, if I was raising uh, VC today, it would have been you know, restaurants powered by AI within the tagline. Um, but uh, you know, we would basically help a host um, make the experience of actually getting a guest from walking in to sitting at their table as soon as possible. And a lot of what we do, and this is an example of one of the screens, we were using uh, Bootstrap, and we're not designers at that point, um, so it's, it's very bare bones. But um, what we were able to do is because of the way we built this algorithm, we could do some very interesting things. So we could, for one, start to predict when a walk-in could be seated. Um, and so in some cases, that could be right now when we tell them which table it could actually go to. In other cases, for larger parties, for example, this restaurant didn't have any availability based on the combination of reservations with us and uh, the people that are currently seated. Um, and then the other thing we could do is that when we talk about the individual reservations here, we could start to plan out the entire night automatically. So when a host would have to do this, it would take five or 10 minutes to be able to plan out a night, we could do it in a couple hundred milliseconds. So we could keep doing it over and over again. And so that's where the difference is, in this case, the locks meant that the host actually locked that table in. The, the ones where there's no locks, that meant that we just generated that based on the algorithm. And so the issue was, though, uh, you know, one of the many reasons why we failed. Um, one of them was that hosts did not trust our algorithm. Um, and the reason why was that they didn't know why it was working the way it did. It didn't always know why it made decisions the way it did. Um, it was something where, because we were in beta at the very beginning, there were errors or there were bugs, right? And so we burnt a lot of the trust up front when we were trying to uh, work with these hosts. And so uh, I think that's like that's something that's just like so visceral for me is that when I was working on this, this company, I was at least I was staging the restaurant at least once a week. As a host. And so seeing their real concern about, you know, this thing is messing up my capability to run a restaurant effectively um, was, very, was really visceral for me. And so, anyways, I, I just want to make sure it's clear. Like, it does matter that people trust 
um, your software, that they trust your services, they trust your users. Um, and so, you know, how do machines actually build trust with humans? And so, uh, looking back to the performance, accountability, and transparency, I, I think there's a couple of key points here. So we're on performance, right? When we talk about machine learning in particular, um, there's a couple common performance measures. And so uh, accuracy, precision, recall, F1, which is the ratio between those. This is really that for an algorithm, when it takes in a bunch of information and it spits out some type of prediction, how accurate is it based on the reality of the world or the, the truth that we're understanding, right? And, and so you can get into cases, though, where accuracy can be very high, but it can actually be a bad experience. And accuracy can be fairly low, like say in the 40 to 50% range but the experience is pretty good. And so this is not necessarily a good way to think about this. Um, the next one is what's called the confusion matrix. And so this is, I stole this from uh, human-centered machine learning bless you, um, from uh, Google. And so uh, this is called the confusion matrix. It's used a lot in data science and kind of statistical, um, uh, just like the statistical field. What it means is that at the very upper left-hand corner, it's that the prediction that the system makes is in um, alignment with what the reference or the truth of the world is. So it means that the, the machine learning algorithm says that it should do something, and the truth is it should do something. And so that's a good thing, right? That's called a true positive. Um, if it says it shouldn't do something, and it shouldn't do something, um, that's called a true negative. Now when we get into some trickiness, it's really around the false positive and the false negative. So false positives are that it thinks it should do something, and it does something, but it shouldn't. Um, so that could, you know, uh, and then the, the opposite is false negative, which is that it doesn't think it should do something, and it should. So let's take an example of like an autonomous vehicle. So let's say that there's an autonomous vehicle that has some type of uh, sensing apparatus to detect if someone is in front of the car. And if it detects that someone's in front of the car, it slams on the brakes, right? So in the case of a false negative, is that we would think that there's nobody in front of the car, but there is, and it hits them, right? So that's really bad. Um, the false positive in that case is that it thinks that there is someone in front of the car, but there isn't, so it slams on the brakes, and it's not that, right? Um, so that's, that's the difference between that. But it doesn't always mean that false, po false negative or false positive is worse than the other. It depends on the circumstance. You could imagine that in the case of, say, uh, you know, uh, doing certain types of uh, x-ray analysis, you could find that a false positive that you think there's a cancer there would cause a lot of kind of costly procedures that could be, uh, cause a lot of other health after effects, right? Whereas a false negative would not detect it, but maybe the occurrences are so small that overall the false negative is less of an impact to the entire population. So, so that's another very important performance measure. Um, but I think what's interesting about all these things, and I think this is partially a problem uh, with just technology in general, is there's this, uh, there's this kind of rule or heuristic that every number is either zero, one, or infinity. Um, and what that means is that really either there's a lack of something, there's one of something, or there's just lots of something. Um, and so what this means, and I, I think the reason why this is a little bit of a problem is that when we talk about things like accuracy, um, even just like raw numbers of, uh, you know, when we talk about say, monthly active users, daily active users, it makes the assumption that we should go to infinity with monthly active users and daily active users. There's never a time that someone just says, actually, this is a no daily active users, right? Um, and this is really important because when we talk about how, um, you know, what this means, in this case, uh, Reed Hastings during one of his calls, I think it was a year or so ago, started talking about how his, the main competitor for them is actually sleep, right? And that's probably a bad thing <laughs> for people in general. Um, so, you know, there's, there is kind of a current movement about wellness within technology. Google just talked about this at the Google I.O. and how they, they start to make people more aware of the amount of time they're on. Uh, of an actual device. And so I guess that's what I'm saying is that when we talk about performance measurements, a lot of the time with machine learning, it's about perfection towards some type of truth. But the reality is that it should be more about what is better for the humans that are involved. Um, and so this is more like the law of medium numbers, which uh, comes from systems thinking. And so it's the idea that, you know, yes, there's very small numbers, and that, that's something where we do a particular type of model. Um, and then there's like large numbers, like thermodynamics, where we do averages of but the things that get really tricky and are kind of like where the squishiness is in the system is the human beings. And that's usually that middle range of numbers where it's not as easy to just understand very basic modeling versus uh, the idea of like very large model. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's very important. Um, there's a talk, uh, Shane Lewin, who is part of Microsoft now um, at the O'Reilly AI Conf, which was just like a month or a month ago. Um, during his talk, he, he 
said something that really resonated for me, which is that this, this optimization function, um, which is really what, when we talk about machine learning, machine learning is about trying to reduce the amount of error between what it thinks the world is and what the, the truth is of the world, and that's called an optimization function. Um, and what really matters, though, is that the optimization function is your strategy. Because whatever you're trying to error correct towards is what you're going to put all of your resources behind within your organization. And you really want those things to be aligned with whatever is human. Um, the next thing is accountability. Um, so when we talk about accountability, you know, so this is a really awesome GIF where this driver realizes that they missed their exit. Um, don't worry, I think the other car's gonna stop too. Um, so they made their exit, thank God. Um, but the thing that's interesting about this is that if that was an autonomous vehicle, right, that, that autonomous vehicle did not get into an accident. Um, but it did cause other accidents, right? Um, and so uh, when we talk about this type of thing, um, there's a great uh, paper called Moral Chromosomes. And so I think one of the issues around accountability, especially with machine learning and AI right now, is that it's very hard to determine where that problem is. And when we talk about moral chromosomes, is that generally the operator of the system is the one who takes fault. Um, so this is, you know, in the case of autonomous vehicles, uh, Japan has regulation that anybody who gets into an accident with an autonomous vehicle, it's on the onus of the driver and on their insurance, for example. And so that puts the crumple zone on the human being, even though there were developers, there were manufacturers, there were all these different people. Um, and, and I think what's really special, what's really important about this is that when we talk about accountability, is it's actually, there's, it's a very tough issue, but we need to in some way understand what that means when we're building these types of systems. Um, this is another example. This is a Farak 25, which is a machine that would give chemotherapy doses to people that have cancer. Um, and unfortunately, uh, due to a bunch of kind of uh, factors at the same time, so a mechanical problem, there was a problem with the way that error messages were displayed, uh, there was a, a particular software bug, all of those three things together meant that about four or five people died of overdosing of radiation. Um, and so what ended up happening is that between versions of this, uh, the operator would say to put down a dose um, of radiation, and it would give back an error message that made the operator think that the, the dosage had not been given. Um, but there was a mechanical lockout that was changed between two versions, and there was a software glitch that then was exacerbated by that. Um, and so when we think about like accountability, we have to do a much better job, I think, of understanding and maybe taking accountability for the, the systems that we actually built. Um, and so this is another uh, great paper if you want to read it around accountability and computerized society. And so you know this is something where um, I'm not sure what the right answer is. I think you know as we try to make good decisions or try to build ethical systems, we should be taking this on. But I also think this is where things like GPRD, for example, um, are trying to address, especially the privacy. But I think there's a, you know that's the reason why the FDA exists. I think we're going to see more and more of this type of regulation because it is unclear who is at fault in that. Case. Was it the hardware manufacturer? Was it the programmer? Was it the operator? Um, and, and this was, yeah, so it's, it's a very complicated issue, but it's one that I think is really important as we start to talk about trust with computers or automation. And then transparency. And when we say transparency, um, it really means how does the person understand what the machine is doing, right? How do they build mental models about what the machine is doing? Um, and so a lot of that is actually user experience or user interface. Um, so here's a couple things that I've, I've looked at. And so, this is um, from a particular project that worked on around field service operations. And field service operations is if uh, someone, a field tech, needs to go on site to say, like, fix a refrigerator um, or something where they have to go somewhere to fix something. Um, and so in our case, it was actually gas stations. Um, and then there's a dispatcher that helps organize all of this work for field techs. And there's a lot of other people that are involved. Um, but in this particular case, we were building something called Patrick, which was originally a chatbot, which failed. Um, but then we started thinking about how do we help out these dispatchers in the way that they actually do their work. And so in this case, this is um, an explanation that is put in line uh, to kind of a, a job workflow tool on why Patrick made a particular decision about scheduling a particular time. And so this comes down to what's called interpretability. So how is it that I'm able to build a mental model about the machine that I'm working with? And so it doesn't matter actually what the machine does. It doesn't even matter what the original designer of the system um, means it to do, it's what the person thinks it does that really matters. So these mental models around interpretability are very important. Um, and it's, 
And I think there's a little bit of uh, kind of maybe some terminology uh, pedanticness that I, I go through around this. Like there's a lot of discussion about explainability within machine learning today. Um, but I think it, it, it actually doesn't matter what the machine learning algorithm actually does. It's more about how does the human make, uh, understand that and then make the right types of decisions based on the information. Um, the next thing is what we'll call like intelligent or adaptive call to action. So um, one of the things that, that a uh, machine learning algorithm or an AI system can help with people is that they can push them in the right direction towards what types of actions should they take at this point based on the knowledge of the system and the state of the system. And so in this case, um, we had a particular area that really talked a lot about, you know, for this job, what is the next step? And so there were a lot of different things that you could do. You could schedule the job, you could start to work parts of it. And so it was trying to make sure that um, the right type of offer or option was being given um, to the actual operator in that, in that case. The next thing is abstractions. And so as we start to build more and more complex systems, um, it really comes down to that the way that the person understands the world today, um, they need to find better ways to understand the world. And I mean, that's a little clunky. Um, when I say abstractions, I mean right now when we think about, like, say, insight from data science, it's usually building graphs so I can have a better understanding around something. When we talk about abstractions, it's how am I understanding the way the world is, but then also taking action on it in some way. And, and this is an example that's from the New York Times um, that, that tried to show why certain types of policy decisions, policy decisions within the MTA has caused, caused a lot of delays in the subway. Um, and so the thing that's really interesting is that once you learn how to read this, you actually can start to play around with different policies and see how it impacts this. And so this is essentially each one of these gray lines and the, the colored ones are basically, it's one subway going at normal speed is the gray line. When it gets delayed, uh, the orange one I think is delayed because of spacing issues, and then red is delayed because of uh, some of the, some of the problem I can't remember. Um, but at the end, as you are tweaking these different variabilities of policies, it becomes very complex. So even policymakers in that case did not necessarily know how they would impact the actual subway system based on the policies that they were they were they were using. And so in this case, this type of abstraction, once you start to learn and become an expert on this type of abstraction, you can make very interesting decisions about minimizing problems and maximizing uh, the benefit to other people. And so these abstractions, I think, as people, and this is where there's, there's something called like the paradox of, of uh, expertise, in that as machine learning and AI starts to take over more and more of the jobs that experts do, they'll gain, they'll have less and less expertise. And so the question becomes, how do they become experts in these new abstractions that allow them to do things that are, that are better than they would have been able to do previously? Um, next thing is generating options. So we talk about uh, machine learning is not always um, kind of binary in the sense that it has one option that is the, the, best, the, the right option. Now, there may be one option that is considered to be the best option by the system. But there's actually multiple options that are potentially generated. There's multiple probabilities that are, that are calculated in some way. And so being able to provide more information about why this option, you know, so it's a little bit of interpretability, but then also offering the capability to switch between the different possibilities that the machine learning algorithm has um, can be really effective to make the human being even better at the decision making. Um, you know, one of the things that machine learning will do is, it, uh, and this is meant to be fuzzy, because uh, I made a mistake. Slides. Um, and if you have to tell a joke, you guys have to describe a joke, it's probably not a very good one. Um, but uh, in this case, you know, a machine learning algorithm can actually detect what is maybe standard. That's what they're really good at. They're good at generalizing patterns. And so they can see things like anomalies that are maybe human mistakes. This also means things like bias, right? Even though uh, machine learning has the, key, the possibility of amplifying bias in certain ways, it also has the capability of potentially detecting bias because bias is an anomaly that maybe doesn't generalize. Um, so that's, that's another thing that I think is, is really important when we talk about how that kind of transparency of the system is that the system thinks this is wrong is really important. Um, next one is illusion of control. So uh, I don't know how many people have realized this, but probably the thermostat in your office or, uh, probably doesn't work. And it's probably not connected to anything. Same thing with the uh, elevator close. I think in New York, elevator close buttons actually do work, but in like California, I just, I just never see them. Right. Um, the reason why is that those buttons or those dials are put there is to make you feel like you have some control over the situation. It makes you feel better, but you actually don't. Um, and so uh, this is maybe a weird one because there's a lot of maybe potentially ethical questions that come up around this, is that how do we make people feel better about using these systems, um, even though the choices that they're given are maybe not real. 
right? Like this is maybe an example of where, uh, you know, my dad was a graphic artist, and so he would, you know, this is back when we would actually do like tissue paper and like print out, like actually print out things uh, to, to show them off to people. And he would always have, if he gave, say, three options, he would always have two of the other options he didn't like had really major errors in them. So like, it would be like the spellings, or it would be like a line that was clearly off kilter in some way if it was supposed to be straight. And so the illusion control was really like, oh, you know, these other two are really bad. I don't know why you can show them to us. You know what I mean? Like, we're going to take this one that is the right one. So I wonder, like, playing into human biases can be a good thing because it can help us do a better job. That's why, like, things like Nudge, if you guys have ever, if anybody read that, this idea of, like, how do you use human biases to actually make, get them to make better decisions for themselves? Um, of course, there's the question then is, like, who are you to decide what's the right decision for something? So there's, there's a lot of ethical questions around that. Um, next one is, is really being upfront about errors. So one of the ways that you can lose trust um, between a, like a machine or a, a automation and a human being is that um, if the machine makes really simple, stupid errors, the human being is much more likely to just not trust them at all. But if they make really complex errors that are hard for the human to understand, they're more likely to give it away. So this idea of like being upfront about certain types of errors, being better about detecting your own errors, or when there's low confidence, being upfront with that um, from a machine standpoint can be really helpful to the human being to adjust their expectations around this. Um, and then, you know, allowing intervention or appeal is really important, right? When we talk about how um, these systems and all the different people that are involved that are affected by these types of uh, machines, um, if you don't allow them in some way to disagree or to escalate or appeal these problems, you get some really bad situations. So a good example of that, I think it's in, um, like Michigan and Idaho, they're now doing benefits, uh, you know, basically for Medicaid uh, through certain types of rule-based systems. And so there's a real issue where people would get certain benefits adjusted down because this new system was put in place. Um, so like hours of assistance, for example. And they disagreed with it. And even the people that were there um, talking to those, those people that were beneficiaries of this um, disagreed with the, the calculation. And then he ended up having to take those companies to court um, to actually get them to even look at the, the, the logic. And it seems like most of the time the logic was actually just faulty and that the rules were not implemented correctly, um, they were coded incorrectly. And so this idea, in this particular case, was that we were automatically assigned field tests. It's not as bad as, say, benefits for Medicaid, but, but that's the issue, right? It's like if you don't allow humans to actually intervene in some way, that you're, you're going to be causing a lot more harm. And if you're, especially if you're not taking into account everybody that's impacted. So probably the people that build these systems really just care about the operators. When I say the operators, I mean the people that are running it at a state level, not the people that are actually there helping people, and not the people that are actually receiving those benefits. Um, and then finally, feedback. Right. So uh, one of the most important things you can do is you can have the machine learn from people. Right. In this case, um, if in our particular like prototypes, if the um, dispatcher decided to change the field tech that was assigned, um, we would ask why, um, because. There may be other things that we're not understanding in the system, we're not collecting that we should be to be able to make that decision better in the future. Um, so now we, we talk about trust. Let's talk about like what is the right level of trust, right? Because you can you can actually trust things too much. Um, and this is a great paper, it's from 97 by uh, Par Um He's pretty prolific in kind of the human computer interface, uh, trust and automation uh, world. But this is a really great paper. And so it talks a lot about use, misuse, disuse, and abuse. Okay? And so use is really just this idea that I will turn on the automated system, I'll utilize it, and I'll turn it off as appropriate. And that's, that's really all. So I'm just going to use the system itself. When we talk about misuse, it means that I trust it too much, and I will actually depend on the system in cases where I shouldn't. Right? So a good example of that is in the case of, say, Uber with the latest with the fatality. That safety driver was not actually paying attention to what they should have necessarily. They trusted the system too much, right? And this is a great. This is uh, from um, Ayana Howard, uh, Dr. Ayana Howard down at Georgia Tech, and so she did this experiment where she invited a bunch of students. Um, she had them fill out some paperwork and then simulated a fire in the building, and then had these robots that were teleoperated uh, try to guide these people. Um, and the thing that was really interesting, so like, this robot would try to guide them into this cluttered room. It would circle around in a room over and over again and would knock into walls. And people still trusted it. Like an alarming amount of time, people trusted that machine so much that they would just like follow around. Now, you could say that maybe they didn't simulate the hazard experiences as well as they could have. Um, 
we, but, but I think the key point here is that in this case, there was too much trust to put in this robot. And maybe even having a robot was the wrong choice. That instead of having a robot that seems very official and knows what it's doing, maybe you should just have like an emergency glow-in-the-dark tape on, on the bottom of the, of the ground so people can then take action. I mean, this is something where um, you know, a lot of the time when there is a fire, people are not stressed enough now to get out of the building. Right? So, so that's, that's like a misuse case, basically. We talk about disuse, this means that I don't trust the system enough that I'll actually utilize it when I should. Um, and so the example I give about this is like ICU nurses, right? So generally in the ICU, if anybody's ever had the unfortunate experience of being there, um, you know, there's these racks of machines, in this case it's giving medication. These are a bunch of different sensors, that's some type of monitoring gear. All of these things give alarms, right? And if they did a calculation where every ICU nurse had to deal with something like 10,000 alarms per day per patient, right? Um, and I don't know if you've ever been in ICU, but like the first time I ever heard one of those alarms going off, I was like, what are we supposed to do? And I was like calling the, the, the nurse to come by, and they're just like, oh, it's fine. They just like turn it off, right? And so this, this shows that in some way, this automation that's in place is not trusted in any way, and it's actually maybe not valuable. Um, so that's, that's disuse. Um, and then finally, abuse is actually when the people that are the designers of the system or the owners of the system don't take into account the actual operator's needs. And so they believe that it should be in a certain way or they believe that, um, you know, in the case of that Medicaid uh, benefits, they didn't take into account the actual person that would be getting the benefits on how they could interact with that system. In fact, there was no way for them to interact with that system. Um, and in this particular case, like when we talk about uh, design thinking, this is uh, Stanford's D-School uh, breakdown of design thinking where we empathize or understand more about the people we're trying to build things for. We define what the problems are, we ideate solutions, we prototype solutions and then we test them. We kind of do this over and over again. When you talk about the abuse scenario, that means that you're just cutting out this entire empathize session. You don't even care. You're not going to talk to the people that are going to be using the system. You're just going to build it the way you think is right. And that's, that's what the problem is, I think, with a lot of automation. So, um, what techniques can we um, start to use to learn about trust um, for these problems and solutions that we're working on? So one of the ones that I, I think is really powerful and really important is problem interviews. So um, you know, if, how many people have done qualitative research before where they've talked to their users? Okay, all right, so 50 and 40 people. Um, I mean, quantitative is definitely important. I, I, I don't know, I tend to, because we do things that are so early stage in our business, we tend to focus on qualitative research most of the time. Um, when we talk about problem interviews, it's really trying to understand like what are the issues that a person has in their, daily, in their life or in their function that you're trying to understand more about. Um, but there is some nuance, I think, when we talk about machine learning and how we understand trust. So um, trust is, is really interesting for me because I almost think about it that the machine is someone that you're trying to train up in the job for the first time. Right? And so some of the, the questions you know, these may be questions you already ask. I think these were a slight difference in the way that we would start to ask these questions, like, you know, what stories do you tell people about how your job works usually? Understanding things like heuristics. Um, what about, you know, tell me about a time in the past that things don't, didn't go right. Like, what did you do? In those particular cases, that helps you understand that when the machine will make a mistake. Like, what is the actual, um, how does that work within the organization? You know, what is, generally, is it a really big deal? Um, is it not a big deal? Um, and that starts to help you understand and break apart what is the trust within that organization itself. Um, how do you explain your understanding to someone else? You know, how do you draw it? And this is meant to be kind of a conceptual activity. So how do people build these mental models when they're trying to convey information to other people about a potentially very tricky circumstance? What is the key information that they need to convey? What are the mental models that they use to start to think about that? Um, and so there's, there's a, Really interesting story about a mathematician that um, you know would do some very like arcane kind of mathematics research around I think it was like convex holes or something like that. And so um, in this particular case, he would draw circles and then uh, lines or parabolas going in and out of these circles, basically, um, because it was a mental model that he was able to use to understand conceptually what it meant um, to uh, to actually build these types of convex holes when he, was, when he was thinking about the theory. Einstein did this with space-time, right? Like, so there's always these mental models that we have, and how are you getting those from the people that are actually doing this job on a regular basis is really, really powerful. Um, because it could be very related to the abstraction that you'll create within your interface, but could also be the terminology that they use. Um, that's really helpful. 
um, how do you cobble together solutions uh, to get what you need done? So one of the things around uh, machine learning and kind of just automation in general is it's this, you know, especially like robotic process automation, which just seems like a crazy term to me. I don't know why it's still being used RPA, but uh, there's no robots involved anymore. It's just software. Um, but uh, the idea is that you know, there's all these different tools that I have to touch on my desktop to say, do intake of a customer support complaint. And I have to copy information from here to there. So there's a lot of like things that I need to do that could just be automated, right? Um, so I, I think that's something that's very interesting. And this maybe gets to also, we talk about like job to be done as a framework. That idea of understanding what is the solution that can help bridge other solutions is really important. Um, and then, you know, how have people built trust when working with you? You know, how is it that you actually trust other human beings that they're going to do their job right? What are the signals they give? What are the assurances they give? Uh, what type of information do they provide? Them? And so this, these are all questions to try to, um, you know, attack or, you know, interrogate this system in the way that they do their job on the basis. Um, the next thing is prototype. And so this is uh, the prototype that we put together for the field service operations. And so you can see here, you know, this is about one particular job. There's a call to action about what I'm supposed to do. Um, there's some recommendations and predictions that are being given by the system. There's a chat between the dispatchers and field techs, but also Patrick, who's this like bot, is added to that conversation. They're automatically including people, things that should be assigned. It's doing automatic scheduling, a bunch of other things like that. And so um, this, though, you know, wasn't actually a built system. It was really just uh, sketch prototypes that were put in the vision. We created a couple different scenarios, but we ended up testing, you know, do people actually trust what's going on? Do they understand what's going on? Um, we also did some things around um, affinitization I'll get to in a second. Uh, sorry, like kind of their, their sentiment about it as well. Um, so there's two prototyping styles I like to think about when we talk about machine learning. So the first one is Wizard of Oz. And so uh, Wizard of Oz is where you basically build a facade of the system, but there's a human being back there. That's the whole point of Wizard of Oz. Um, but in this case, you know, uh, one of the ways that you can understand whether a machine could do it is can a human even do it given enough time, right? So we assume machines can do things faster than us. They can find maybe certain types of generalizations we can't uh, find. But if there's just no way for you to even understand what information you would need to make a decision to do something, then you're probably going to have a very hard time building a system that would do it. Um, so Wizard of Oz is, is basically, from a prototyping standpoint, you either you build some type of, say, web interface or app interface. There's some interface for a person on the back end to gather that information, to do something, and then respond back to the person. Um, but this is based on the assumption that they don't actually know that it's a human being back there. Um, so you can start to understand different trust issues around that as well. I think that's really valuable. Um, the next one is a concierge approach. And so this is the, the opposite of that. So um, in the forefront, you actually don't have any interface other than maybe email or chat or phone, but it's a human being talking to another human being to understand things. But then you're building tools on the back end to actually automate a lot of the processes that the human being is doing. And so that's where you can start to learn like what pieces of this can you automate, um, what are the cobbled together solutions today, that type of thing. Um, and this is some really interesting work being done by Wendy Ju at uh, Cornell. She was at Stanford. Um, and so she does a lot of work right now with automotive. And um, in particular, uh, you know, she actually doesn't build a machine learning system. She doesn't build AI systems. But she does a lot of work. Um, some of her stuff, I don't know if, you ever, if you've seen it, but um, some really interesting work around like automated trash cans on the Stanford campus. Right? So this trash can would see someone had trash and kind of like wiggle up to them and like shimmy a little bit to signal that it wanted trash um, from them. Um, and none of that was built out as an automated system. It was actually, again, it was a puppeteer in the background kind of controlling this through cameras. And they understood how people started to feel about like space with these robots. They started to understand, you know, kids were starting trying to bait the robot into following them with trash and things like that. So a lot of interesting interaction possibilities um, were starting to be understood, but it was all just through basic kind of robotics that would tell operator. And in this case, when we talk about their WAS system, is that it's a system that sits in a car that's trying to act like an assistant or in some ways I think as like an autonomous vehicle uh, type of thing. Um, but all of it is done actually by an operator that can see what the person is seeing and they type commands or have like, you know, hotkey commands that will then be spoken through Alexa, essentially. And so they're, they're testing something that would be like a real automated system within a car, but they didn't build any of it. Um, and I think that's really valuable. Like being able to understand whether something actually meets a problem or solves a problem for someone is way more valuable than you know, wasting time. You know, in the case of, say, machine learning, you know, 
data, data scientists, for example, they will say that about 80% of their time is just cleaning data, and the other 20% of the time is, is actually just complaining about cleaning data. Um, <laughs> and so I think you know, gathering all that data, cleaning it, training a model over like nine months, and then finding out that it doesn't matter, like that's, that's bad. So you should, you should do this way earlier. Um, and then user interviews. Once you do have a prototype, how you start to talk to um, the end users and understanding how they would react in different circumstances is really valuable. Um, and this is maybe where there's the nuance, right? Like we still, generally I think whenever we do usability testing, for example, we do a lot of, I think a lot of people end up getting fixated on what we would call the happy path of the, the usability. Um, but it's really important to test a lot of different scenarios. And so in this case, you know, the correct operation is just that it, in this, the machine learning algorithm and the AI works the way it says it would. It seems seamless, it just works, right? Um, but there's, you should also be testing, like what does it mean um, for incorrect operation? Do people actually understand that it's incorrect, right? Um, and there's, there's, there's ways you can do this that are you know, harder to orchestrate and easier to orchestrate, um, but really should be getting to this point, like are they intervening when they should, right? Um, both sides of the borderline for misuse and disuse. And what I mean by that is that, is there a case where um, if they trust it too little and they don't use it, that's bad, right? Like, but that they're trusting it. So, like, where is it on the opposite line of trust that they are? So, yeah, let me, let me try to explain that again. So, if they, is there a case where they should still trust it, but it seems really shaky? That's the borderline on the the you know the right side of trust. Is it a case where they um, should not trust it, but they do, right? That's another side of this. So, trying to understand those like edges of the experience and understanding um, from the human is really important. Uh, feedback from the human to the machine, like when something does go bad, what type of feedback do they want to give? Um, what is the right kind of um, analysis that they're doing around that? Um, and then state communication, so just are the abstractions making sense? Are, are they building the right mental models in the human? Um, so there's a bunch of information you know, that I, I, I tend to ask, and these tend to be, you know, again, trying to be as unbiased as possible, trying to be as open-ended as possible. Um, and, and in the end, like, when we talk about trust, like, we may formulate it in certain ways, but they, people just think about, they have their own definition of trust, right? So actually probing whether they trust something or not, and what does that mean to trust something, is, is pretty important. Um, and this was some interesting research we did where we, um, after doing some prototyping, we actually looked on, on a, the scale is actually from negative sentiment to positive sentiment, and then not understanding to understanding what the machine is doing, okay? And we started a cluster of things in the sense that things that were down here, like where they, they didn't understand whether they liked it or they didn't, it meant that we were doing a poor job in the user experience, we were doing a poor job explaining, you know, the interpretability was that there was some problem that we need to address. In the upper right hand corner, these were things where they feel really happy about it and they understand what's happening, and that's that's a good type of automation. Those are the things that you should immediately start to think about, like how do we build models or train models to do this type of predictive case. And then the upper left-hand corner um, were things that they knew what it was doing, but they were not happy about. It. And generally, that was around job security issues. Um, and so, like, is this going to take over my job in some way? And I think what's interesting here is that you probably, even though you could maybe do those types of things better, there's a couple different options, right? You could decide that it's maybe not worthwhile because you want to provide the effectiveness of a human in the rest of these cases, where they 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 still feel good about. It, it could be that you provide things like the illusion of control. Um, what I always worry about is when we talk about machine learning and AI, people are overly fixated on just automation rather than augmenting the way humans do their work. And so, in this particular case, these ones, maybe we need to go back and understand, you know, are we actually attacking the problem in the wrong way? Are we aiding them in the wrong way? Um, so in conclusion, you know, uh, using AI is just like any other technology. I mean, there's, there's definitely nuance, and so you should be aware of what those nuances are, but you need to be, uh, be able to, like, have those discussions of trade-offs. Um, you should build for the right amount of trust, and that means not too much or too little. And then, you know, trust is really based on you know, a trifecta of performance, accountability, and transparency um, to the human. Um, so, you know, I work for philosophy. We do a lot of AI strategy coaching. We do hackathons or facilitation uh, of hackathons. We do what's called balanced team, which is really a product team to build AI solutions. And then finally, a lot of workshops. Um, so if you want to talk to me for 30 minutes for free, you just give me your business card. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we'll take questions now, though. Yeah. Hey, uh, thanks, Chris, for the uh, very interesting. Uh, talking about trust, um, I was wondering why you didn't mention the example uh, from uh, 
the Alex said that reported the scuffle last week uh, in a way around this the arriving this conversation. Uh, without the knowledge, like uh, Alex oh, is yeah. recording the conversation she had and then send the conversation to like her husband's uh, and colleague yeah, like yeah. across the country. Yeah. Uh, this was like a design failure yeah. and like definitely a breach of trust. Yeah. And after like she heard about it, she said like she contacted uh, Amazon and said like I don't want this device, I can't trust it. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I, yeah. So the, the question was it's just like around this uh, the Amazon Echo. I recorded the conversation and then sent it to a coworker, um, and they didn't really know what like they didn't understand how they had triggered that behavior, basically, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're right. I mean. If, in that case, when we talk about privacy especially, privacy is very interesting because it's one of those things where I think a lot of people just don't care about it at all until there's a violation of it in some way that matters to them. Yeah, and I think the other thing is that like uh, when you're dealing with AI products, especially in the NLP uh, field, it's dealing with biometric data, your face, your voice. Yeah. So I mean, it's more than like a breach of privacy. It's more like, uh, I would say, like uh, body freedom or, you know, like, it's very much with data, so it's a, it's a yeah. positive type of knowledge. I wouldn't say that AI is a technology like any other, yeah. but in that, in that sort of sense. No, I, I agree with you, and I, I mean, I think, well, so I don't know. I mean, when we talk about privacy, it's a very tricky issue because, you know, like, we live here in New York, and probably, you know, we don't necessarily have more privacy, but we have more kind of anonymity. People don't care about, like, walking by each other up here. Mm -hmm. But if you're in a small town, everybody knows what you're doing. Right. So I don't know. There's some very interesting implications when it comes to that idea of like biometric data as well. I think this is why, like when we talked about like security experts, mm -hmm. they usually try to focus on three different things: like something that you are, um, something that you know, and something that you have. Right. Because like the truth is, is when it comes to if like my fingerprints are compromised, there's no way I can change my fingerprints. Right. right? I can't change my retina. Um, I can't even very easily change my gait um, when I'm like walking. And so yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely huge issues around that. I, I would say, though, that it's not necessarily like an AI issue. I mean, if anything, AI can do, or machine learning in this case, right, can do very interesting things as far as prediction of who that might be based on that. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I, I, I guess I, I see that less as like a, I don't know, this is really interesting to me, too, because I, I keep on seeing all this um, discussion about if we just had like an ethics 101 course that every computer scientist had to take in school, mm -hmm. it would be perfect, right? And the truth is, that's not the case, yeah. right? Like, um, there needs to be something more about the way we actually design these systems, the way that we are held responsible for these systems. Um, that, yeah, anyways, I, sorry, that's kind of a messy answer. I don't think there's like a really good one though to what I'm talking about. There's a question. That's right. Question. Yeah. Hey, uh, so the three interesting talk, and the thing that interested me most coming from a design and research background was when you talked about human centers AI. Um, so I've seen that a lot of clients that I work with they really find it difficult to uh, correlate between qualitative and quantitative yeah. data, especially when there are so many contradictions between one and the other. Sure. So um, how do you think that going ahead with AI and you have so much larger data sets, and on the other side, you have qualitative data which is limited in sample size, and yeah. it's very difficult to scale. How do you bring these together, and how do you well, complement? Yeah, so, so the question is like, how, how do we deal with the difference in qualitative versus quantitative, especially with like human-centered AI? And you know, I wonder actually for how long um, qualitative data will be so hard um, to understand in a quantitative way. Because when you look at like everything that makes Alexa do what it does, like NLP, right? Um, that's something we can start to use with our qualitative research as well, right? There's a couple startups that are just focused on kind of you know um, understanding emotional content of people as they're reviewing, um, say, doing usability. Uh, you can start to basically pull apart clips of video. You can start to turn all of that into text. You can do sentiment analysis. You can do um, clustering and understanding of context. Right. You can start to build knowledge graphs based on all the concepts that people are bringing up. And so, <clears throat> I guess I feel like one of the big benefits of AI and machine learning are this, like, mostly machine learning. Right, is really going to be that it helps make qualitative data more, more simplistic to understand in a way that we understand quantitative data. But I also don't think that, that again, that's not the end at all. Right? Like we as humans still need to interpret all of this. And, and I think that's one of the biggest problems. Like when we talk about product people, um, one of the most rookie mistakes I see for product people is that you know, they pick a particular way to prioritize things, and then it has to be prioritized based on that system going forward. 
rather than the idea that prioritization is actually a starting point. Right? So you get this list of things that you prioritize, but then you should have that discussion with your team because every, everybody on the team actually has a different viewpoint around these things. So a lot of the techniques that like, we've, we've been working on something called empathy mapping for the machine or confusion mapping, which are like co-creation exercises where you bring people, not only like data scientists and engineers, but also designers, product people, executives, and even customers, into the conversation of like, what are the expectations for this system? Right? What are the outcomes that matter? What are the failures or the you know, false positives or false negatives that actually hurt the most? What are the things that we need to avoid the most? And so I think it's that it comes down to that the discussion between the entire team is what matters um, when we talk about this. It's not one side of it. Right? That's what I always worry about, is that we're always like siloing ourselves into like our practice of some type. And I, you know, again, I guess I straddle a little bit of the design research on the product side, and so we don't have that type of siloing within philosophy, but I see it at a lot of other places. Very nice talk, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, contrasting between a typical software product which is automating, let's say, you know, a solution, right? Whatever the problem may be, versus an AI-based solution for that, for, for, for let's say a problem, right? Yeah. I guess what I'm trying to get towards is, in a typical product a solution uh, approach, you would, you would, you know, you would do some testing to make sure it's ready yeah. for their users and all <coughs> things, right? You get feedback and all that. Yeah. But in the AI context, or in the AI case, yeah. do you test for longer? When do you know, sure. how do you know you're ready? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, the question is like, how do you deal with just like assurances that the software will do what it's, it's meant to do right. between more traditional software products versus AI? Right. Well, and I would, I, would one, I would just say that there's a lot of bugs in traditional software as it is, right? right? So it probably gets even more exacerbated when we talk about machine learning or AI. Um, I think, you know, when you look at, uh, so there's a great article in The Atlantic about uh, Waymo and how they do testing of their autonomous vehicles. And so not only do they have, you know, there's this like old airport or military base they took over and just built a bunch of like example roads for their, their things to drive around. They have all this stuff that they throw out on the road to, to like understand those types of examples, but they also they invested an awful lot in the idea of simulation. So when you look at like how RL or like reinforcement learning is, is really basing all of the learning on simulation capabilities, I think the long term is actually that simulation is the way you do a lot of this QA. Um, and so you know in this case like Waymo they say they do something like two million miles a day in simulated testing. And they do that not only for scenarios they know about. So you can imagine that when Uber had that fatal accident, everybody that was building an autonomous vehicle, they simulated that the next day, right? right? Just to see how their cars would react in that circumstance. Um, they also add another thing, like you know, kind of like how great QA practice involved what was called fuzzing of like inputs for a long time, and you know, penetration testing and security does this a lot too. But that idea of like how do you start to um, understand invari like variability within these cases. And so I think simulation is the way that that happens. But I think there's some really exciting stuff when we talk about adversarial models within machine learning. So the way that like uh, generative adversarial models is the way that you have two models that are basically fighting against each other. One of them's trying to determine if something's fake and the other one's trying to generate things. This is where you get those like crazy, um, like hyper-realistic photos of celebrities that don't exist, for example. Um, so that's all done through like adversarial model. And so this idea of like, how are you building models that actually attack the, the main models? I think that's the future of a lot of this. I mean, but that's true about everything. Like, everything that, the way we get better at things is actually feedback, right? The idea of um, penetration testing is an adversarial thing. The idea of um, chaos engineering, where you're like, you know, Netflix like shuts off random machines. That's all adversarial types of things, and I think that's the way we get to better models in general, is adversarial. 